Welcome to the next in the Journal of Clinical Investigation series, Conversations with Giants in Medicine. I'm Ushma Neal. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Tony Fauci, the Director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Fauci is at the forefront of infectious disease research with his own personal research focusing on HIV. While he's been acknowledged as one of the most highly cited researchers in all of academia, not just in HIV research, he's also acknowledged for being one of the people leading the national discussion of infectious disease pandemics, the science behind them, the economy, the policy, and the politics that are also intertwined with them. I hope that we get a chance to learn a little bit more about his views today. Good to be with you. All right, so I think from the moment you start speaking, your Brooklyn intonations are going to betray your beginnings. But do you think you can tell me a little bit about what life was like on the streets of Bensonhurst? Yeah, it was uh, a terrific childhood, I think. Uh, it was uh, in Brooklyn. My, my family, my f mother and father, uh, first generation Italian Americans. My grandparents were born in Italy. They did what so many immigrants did, arrived in New York City. Uh, lived for a little bit in Little Italy in Manhattan, moved to Brooklyn, where my mother and father uh, lived their, essentially their entire life. It was where I was born. It was a very nurturing uh, atmosphere and environment, a, a lot of family values, a lot of uh, community appreciation, uh, a lot of friends, uh, some tough knocks. It, it, growing up in the streets of New York City is, you know, sometimes not the, I wouldn't say not the easiest thing in the world, but s certainly uh, challenging for a, for a young child. And you learn to be resourceful, boy. right? You learn to be resourceful, you learn to protect yourself, you learn to be fair, but not taking much guff from anybody. So it was pretty good. So what were you like as a kid? Uh, I was a, a kid who loved to play. I, I was very, very much into sports. Um, I was a, always a studious person in the sense of, uh, liking school, uh, you didn't want to show to your friends that you liked it too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you kind of hid that. But still, nonetheless, you could be a closet liker of school. And I did well in school and enjoyed it. But I very much liked the atmosphere of the neighborhood, playing baseball, playing basketball. And, and I did that all through elementary and high school. So I read once that when it was calculated, you spent 70 days total commuting back and forth to Regis High School in Manhattan. Right, so I went to an elementary school in Brooklyn, not too far from my home in Brooklyn. But I think I did one of the things that had a particularly important impact on me in my life later on, is that I went to a rather elite Jesuit run school, but it was in Manhattan, Regis High School. It was a total scholarship school, highly competitive to get into from all of the five boroughs, including people from uh, New Jersey and other places that we had a, a quite a, uh, a highly motivated class. The trouble is I lived in the Bensoner section of Brooklyn and this was in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. So my days started with a bus to go to a local train, a local train to go to an express stop, an express stop to go to Manhattan, change trains and then go up to 86th Street and Lexington Avenue. That was quite a trip every day. And then since I was on the high school basketball team, when we used to have basketball practice in the afternoon, evening, sometimes as far north as Harlem and the Bronx, by the time we finished that and I got home in the evening, it was pretty late. So it was a long day. I've been doing long days since I was a young boy. I think that's a theme we're going to come back to, yeah. how you manage to fit as much yeah. into a day. Now, your, if I'm correct, your family ran a pharmacy. Yes. So chemistry and the medical field sort of was introduced to you fairly early on. It was, it was. I, as a young boy, uh, would help out. It was a family pharmacy, so my mother used to help out sometimes with the cash register and my sister. I used to deliver uh, in the late afternoon evenings and certainly on the weekends, and that was one of the jobs that essentially I had ever since I could ride a bicycle. Uh, unlike the pharmacies of, the, of today, it was a family neighborhood pharmacy. You'd get a prescription and some young boy, i.e. me, would come in their little Schwinn bicycle with their basket and drop off the prescription in your house. So I did that for years before I went to high school. Now, was it in high school or in college at Holy Cross that your love of science or your desire to move on to medical school was cultivated? Well, it, it started in high school for sure, but it was something that I describe as kind of attention because I was very attracted 
And that was a largely through the opportunity and the influence of the Jesuit way of teaching, very steeped in the humanities and in the classics. And I became very enamored of that. I liked humanities, I liked dealing with people. And then when I started to take science courses in high school, I realized that I was fascinated by science, by discovery, uh, by knowledge, by the rational approach to science. And there was this tension that would it be humanities, classics, or would it be science? And as I analyzed that, it seemed to me that being a physician is the perfect melding of both of those uh, aspirations, namely involved deeply with people, something that I still maintain to the present time is my role as a physician, but also being able to explore science. So by the time I finished high school, I went to college wanting to be a physician, and I did a compromise. They had a, a particular unique, uh, sometimes eyebrow-raising course at Holy Cross, which was Classics and Pre-Med. And the title of the course was Bachelor of Arts dash Greek Classics dash Pre-Med. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really kind of bizarre in some respects. So we did a lot of classics, Greek, Latin, a Romance language, French I took, and we took many credits of philosophy, everything from epistemology to philosophical psychology, logic, et cetera, et cetera. But we took enough biology and physics and science to get you into medical school. So even through college, I still had that tension of wanting to be steeped in the humanities or steeped in the science. Do you have a favorite Latin or Greek phrase? Can you still speak any of it? Do you remember any of it? Well, I, well, I have. My favorite Latin one is one I have to deal with every day as director of NAID, and that is illegitimi non carborundum, which translates, don't let the bastards wear you down. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So while you were in college, you spent some summers back in the city right. working construction. I did, I did. And one of the summers you spent working on a new library for Cornell's medical school. Correct, correct. It was sort of an interesting historical point in my life. I, would, uh, I worked for the four summers through college in, in construction and you don't pick your job. You go down to the union hall and they say you, you and you are going to go to this job. And then one day in one of the summers, they said, you are going to go up to 69th Street and York Avenue where they're renovating and tearing down the old library and putting up the Samuel J. Wood Memorial Library. I said, wow, this is great. I had in my mind the idea that I would want to come back to New York City and, and go to Cornell. I wanted very much to go back to New York City. I was in Worcester at Holy Cross. So Cornell was my top choice as a, as a medical school, but I worked that entire summer uh, on as a construction gang. So it was very interesting because for the years that I was there as a medical student, intern, a resident, chief resident, as I would walk by the street, I would remember the, sitting there with my construction boots and my hat and my my uh, sunglasses, you know, pushing a wheelbarrow. <laughs> I've seen it all the way through. There's a sweet anecdote that gets told in your acceptance of the Cobra Medal about how in your dusty boots you were looking into the library when a security guard uh, came up, right? Yeah, that was really funny. It's a true story. That, you know, it's, it's one of those things you can't make up. It was lunchtime and all the rest of the construction guys were sitting along the, the sidewalk whistling at the nurses go by and I thought I would just take a walk into the medical school because we were working on the library which was really right near the auditorium just a few steps so I walked up the steps and walked in and looked at the Eurus auditorium and as I was there I was all dirty I had a lot of dust on me uh, my fatigue pants on and my boots and the security guard nice fellow came by and he says excuse me but you've you've really got to leave you can't you're gonna dirty the whole place up and I looked at him and I says, you know, one of these days I'm going to be a medical student at this place. And he looked at me and he says, yeah, one of these days I'm going to be police commissioner. So get out of here. <laughs> and then, truth be told, you graduated first of your class yeah. from Cornell Medical School. Yeah. 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 So what was that time like? And did it kindle in you a desire to do patient care? Were you exposed to research during medical school? Um, Cornell was a phenomenal place. I mean, the spirit and the atmosphere... Uh, the collegiality really 
created a very warm feeling about medicine in general. I, I think it's one of the greatest places you can imagine. I was heavily steeped in wanting to be a physician. I loved clinical medicine. I loved taking care of patients, the sicker, the better. I, I really did like it very much. I did a research project as an elective in my third year in the division of gastroenterology with a fellow named Marvin Schlesinger who ultimately went to San Francisco. And I started to see uh, how interesting it is to ask a scientific question. But I kind of put it in the back of my mind. What I really wanted to do was I wanted to get involved in this new burgeoning field of the interface between immunology and infectious diseases. And at the time, the, the Korean War was on, and all doctors were, were drafted. And I was of that generation, many of whom uh, went down the NIH from that, is that you could either go into the Army, the Air Force, uh, the Navy, or the Public Health Service. So when we were in our senior year, I remember a major from the Marines came down and got the whole class together. And he said, at the end of this year, everybody in this class except the two women over there. And we only had two women in the class in, in, in 1966 when I, when I graduated. All of you are going to be either in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, or the Public Health Service. So you know, sign up. So I put. I, I, I liked infectious disease, so I wanted to either go to the NIH or the CDC. So I put public health service first, Navy second, Army, and then Air Force. As it turns out, I got into the, uh, the NIH. And that really transformed things for me because my full intention was to finish my residency, go down to NIH, uh, spend three years as an infectious disease slash immunology fellow, come back to the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center as a year of chief resident, mm -hmm. and then just essentially go into practice and teach. As it turned out, when I got down to, to the NIH, I really became quite enamored of the scientific method, asking a question, getting an answer, analyzing data. And at the third year was really a turning point in my career because I had accepted the job as chief resident in medicine mm -hmm. at Cornell at the same time that my mentor at the NIH, Shelley Wolf, offered me a full senior position, independent, essentially the equivalent of a tenured investigator, which today which is amazing to, to offer that to somebody so young with so few accomplishments and so little experience. So when I left in, in June of that year to go back to New York, he said, this job is waiting for you when you come back. And I explained to him that I really would love to do it, but I would have to continue to be heavily involved in clinical medicine if I came back. And he said, that's what exactly what I want you for. I want you to be a, a bench scientist as basic as you could be, but I also want you to have that interface between basic science and clinical medicine. So I went back to Cornell for a year, I had a wonderful year as chief resident, all the clinical experience you'd ever want to have. And I came back to, to the NIH and began what I'm still in now, is essentially a, a lifelong career in, in research that's very closely interdigitated with clinical medicine. What is it about the NIH that has kept you so devoted, entwined, entangled, all of those words? Well, it's, 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 for me, it's an electrifying place. Um, it's an extraordinary critical mass of very smart, very collegial people with a wide range of expertise. You don't have to walk or jog very far to find somebody that's, you know, if not the world expert, close in a particular area that you're interested in. Um, the clinical center was a major attracting force for me. I've spent many, many, many years uh, studying first vasculitis patients at the clinical center where we developed the treatments for Wegener's granulomatosis and polyarteritis nodosa. And then when HIV came in 1981, I made a dramatic shift in my career and began admitting patients with this strange disease. We weren't even calling it AIDS yet, and we certainly did not know that HIV was the cause. So that ability to turn on a dime and ask a question uh, as part of the intramural research program was extremely attractive to me. And, and the attraction still remains. What was it that made you choose to study infectious disease? Because your early research, as you just said, was much more on mm -hmm. rheumatology right. and immunoregulation. Yeah. 
Well, I wanted to do infectious disease for two reasons. One, as a clinical person. Uh, my personality profile is that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of on the borderline of wanting to be a surgeon. I, I wanted something that was clear cut, identify it, do something about it. I wanted something that could make you very sick and kill you unless I intervened. And if I intervened, you're essentially cured. Now that seems a little bit too simplistic, but that's really the nature of most infectious diseases is that it can kill you, it's a serious disease, but it's something if you diagnose and treat it correctly, you can essentially get the person essentially back to baseline. I liked that. So that was the clinical aspect. The research aspect is that since I was trained in immunology and my basic research at the bench during those early years at the NIH was fundamental classic human immunology, and there weren't a lot of people working on human immunology at the time. There, most people were mouse or guinea pig or mm -hmm. rabbit immunologists. There were a few people, people like Max Cooper and Tom Waldman, and my heroes at the time were the ones that were Bob Good and others that were, were doing that. So I wanted to study the interface between the immune system and infectious diseases. And that's really important because that is something that I wanted to do 10 years before HIV came along. And as the history unfolded when HIV came along, that's one of the reasons why I, I made that dramatic shift, much to the dismay of my mentors, who I had a very successful career. The trajectory was like that and the things I was doing with inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. And then in 1981, when the first reports of gay men from first Los Angeles and then New York, San Francisco and Los Angeles came in. I remember reading it and saying, oh my God, this is a new disease. This is really what I want to study. It's, it's clearly an infection. We don't know what it is. It's destroying the immune system. So who better than someone who's an immunology infectious disease person to study this? And that's when I essentially stopped what I had been doing so successfully and started bringing in HIV infected individuals who we didn't know it was HIV at the time. I, I remember my mentors looking at me saying, why are you doing this? You're throwing away a potentially great career. And I said, no, 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 this is going to really be big. Trust me. So let's talk a little bit more about that time because I can imagine as a clinician, it must have been a very heady, frustrating, depressing time, yeah. but yet as a scientist, as your lab was starting to really figure out the early steps of HIV pathogenesis and then later on the early aggressive viral control that must have been quite invigorating yeah. as a scientist. So it's just a mix of emotions. Yeah. I mean, what were you going well, through Well, it, it's exactly that. It was a complex of emotional highs and lows. The, um, if you look historically, I had been for the, I came back from my chief residency in 1972. And from 1972 to 1981 were the heady years of developing essentially curative therapy for Wegener's granulomatosis and polyarteritis nodosa and the systemic vasculitity. So I, for nine years, was someone who someone came in with a disease that historically they were expected to die. And I would give them the Fauci protocol and they would get better. And they would get up out of the hospital, walk out, their family loved me, they loved me. And all of my patients were doing well. So it was an extraordinary period. Then when I went into HIV, I describe it as the dark years of my professional career and even the dark years of my life because every one of my patients died. I mean, and I brought in hundreds of patients during those early years. The median survival was six to eight months at the time when we didn't even know what the virus was and we certainly didn't have any therapies. That means that 50% of my patients were dead in eight months. That was a terrible feeling on a day-by-day -day basis. But as you point out correctly, every, thing, every time you made another observation, it was a new observation. I mean, we started off making observations about pathogenesis before we even knew what the virus was. Uh, the, the paradox, one of my first papers in HIV was in the New England Journal of Medicine in which I described the aberrant immune activation, the paradox of an immunodeficiency disease in which the immune system was aberrantly turned on. I had no idea what that meant. I kept on scratching my head. Isn't this interesting? Hyper immune, hyper aberrant immune activation and yet immunodeficiency. What is going on? And as it turns out, you fast forward 
10, 12, 13 years when we really got our arms around things, when we had the virus and were able to study the virus and we could treat people and bring the virus from a half a million copies down to 40 copies, that immune activation is actually the driving force of HIV replication. Mm -hmm. So it's a paradox that the, that the virus turns on the immune system, activates it, and the very activation is the thing that drives virus replication. And we didn't know that when we made that first observation in 1984. We, we had no idea. Where do we stand with HIV treatment? Well, I think that's one of the most extraordinary success stories, literally, in the history of medicine. So we've gone from not even knowing what the virus is to knowing what it is, developing drugs over a period from the first drug that was used empirically as a screening drug, AZT, approved in 1987, to 1996 when we had the triple combinations, and from 96 to the present time, where now that same patient that I described who would come in if he were or she were 20 plus years old and were recently infected, if I start them on triple combination, which you can now get in one single pill once a day, uh, you could project to that person if they take their medicines faithfully that they would live an additional 50 years, five zero. So to go from a six month survival, eight month survival to 50 years is just Breathtaking. Astonishing. It's yeah. astonishing. Yeah. One of the further challenges that you in particular have had to face is that you're the primary driver working with the politicians. Right. So in your acceptance of the 2006 Cobra Medal, your remarks, which I encourage everybody to read because it's a really fascinating insight into the way that science works, was entirely about your history of dealing with politicians right. in the U.S. government. Right and who listened, and who listened well, right. and what you were able to get out of them. Did you have any idea when you started no. this job in 71 that you were going to have to spend quite so much time on politics and advocacy? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I think one of the, the best things I did was realize that this is the terrain, so get used to it and get good at it. And, and I learned some fundamental principles. Uh, I described that uh, at my address at, at, at the COBRA, but it, it was learning, but learning quickly. And one of the first things is that relationships between people in power in the Congress, the congressmen and women, the senators, the chairs of the committee, and importantly, the presidents of the United States. I never would have in my wildest dream have thought that I would have been advisor to five separate presidents. But as it turns out, the position that I'm in, particularly with the person right at the forefront in HIV and pandemic flu and the anthrax attacks and emerging infections, that they were of particular public health interest and attracted the attention of people all the way up to the president. And what I've learned is that, first of all, you gotta separate and understand the difference between politics and policy. Okay, policy is you make a decision about going in a certain direction because it's the right thing to do when you get the right policy. Politics has a little seeminess to it. You know, it's kind of, well, you know, you lie a little, you do that. Stay away from the politics and focus on the consistency of the relationship between science and policy. And the other thing I learned is that it's very heady and it really feels good to get invited to the White House and to sit in the Oval Office and the, and the uh, Situation Room and in the Roosevelt Room and talk to presidents, which I've had the privilege of doing. But you gotta make sure you don't make that go to your head to the point of telling someone in power what you think they want you to hear. Because you can do that and get away with it once or twice, but then after a while, people will lose respect for you because some people, and I know several of them, will go in and wanting to make sure that they get invited back because it really feels so good to be sitting down talking to a chair of a committee or to the president of the United States. That's a big mistake. You've gotta go in and a wise person, an old friend of mine who I met years and years ago who happened to work in the Nixon White House for six years, said to me, when you go into the White House, you should always tell yourself that this may be the last time that I ever go in here because don't go in wanting to get asked back. Go in and saying, I'm gonna tell this person exactly what evidence-based scientific truth is. If they don't like it, 
and they get upset with me and I don't get asked back, so be it. But the chances are that even if they don't like it, the word will be out that you speak truth and you speak truth to power. And that has been something that I've lived by over the last 30 years as director and it really has served me very well. There were times when I did get them upset and then they would think about it and they say, you know, I think you're right, come on back, let's talk about it again. Is it true that you were asked to be the director of NIH twice? Uh, more than twice, <laughs> yes. And you turned them down both I did. times. I, I did, I did. I, and the reason I did is that I felt strongly that I had reached the point where the balance between being close to the science, being able to continue to do clinical medicine, and yet still having a broad and significant impact on policy was where I am now as the director of NIAID. Um, you know, I remember very clearly that Secretary um, uh, of HHS, uh, Lou, Lou Sullivan, during the George H.W. Bush uh, administration, couldn't believe that I didn't want to be NIH director. And he said, the Bush administration is saying, bring Tony in and we'll offer him the job. And I said, I don't want it. And, and, and Lou Sullivan said, well, you go tell the president. I'm not going to tell him. So I said, Lou, don't do it. Don't bring me to the White House because I'm going to have to say no to, no to the president. And uh, he said, oh, no, no, there's no way you're going to do that. We're bringing to the White House. He brought me to the White House. And John Sununu was the chief of staff at the time. And we were waiting outside the Oval Office. And George H.W. Bush was there. And, and, and um, uh, Sununu said, you are going to accept it, aren't you? And I said, uh, Governor, just Governor Sinner, I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not. He says, no way, you're going to say no to the president. So I walked in, I sat down, and George H.W. Bush, in his wonderful way, truly, forget about politics, is really one of the nicest human beings you'll ever want to meet. We chatted a bit, and then he said, I want you to be the NIH director. And I said, you know, Mr. President, with all due respect, I think I can serve you and the country better if I stay where I am, because we were right in the evolution of the AIDS pandemic. And I said, this is what I do and what I do really well, and this is really what you want me for. And we talked about it a bit, and then at the end of it, I thought he was gonna really blow me off and be very, very gruff about it. And he said, you know, I respected you a lot before today, but now I really respect you. So go back and, and do your thing. And as I walked out the door, uh, John Sununu grabbed me by the arm and he said, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and we, we both of us started laughing. And, and, and then that actually strengthened my relationship with George H.W. Bush because after that he continued to call upon me and ask my advice about things. So rather than being a negative, it turned out to be actually a positive. So it seems that you have a deft touch, not only with politicians, but also with activists. So I've seen pictures of... Uh, signs from HIV protests, especially in the early days when the uh, activists didn't think that the government was doing enough right. to find treatments for HIV. There's a particular poster that said, Dr. Fauci, you are killing us. Right. So how did you turn that sort of a relationship around to then have some of these activists be your close friends? Uh, I think what it was, and, and Again, I, I think back of the things that I've done that really were good things in the sense that that was a smart move, Tony. Uh, and, and that was that the activists wanted attention. They were suffering, they were frightened, they were frustrated. And they, at the time, the government, particularly in the Reagan administration, and to a lesser extent with George H.W. Bush, but we turned him, I turned him around, not I, a lot of people did, but we, we, we helped turn him around, and he was really good. Uh, but with Reagan, Reagan, for reasons that we don't understand, didn't even mention AIDS until his second term, which the activists were furious about. That See, there's a typical example of the government doesn't give a damn about us because we're gay men, we're injection drug users, et cetera. So I was, because I was out there, I was on television, I was on the radio, I was in the newspaper because I was the AIDS person I was totally identified with the federal government. So even though the things that they were frustrated about, the rigidity of the, of the, of the drug approval process, which is a regulatory thing, they saw me so that it was Fauci, you were killing us. In fact, Larry Kramer, who's a very dear, close personal friend of mine, the, the uber activist, you know, the person who's- From ACT UP. Yeah, started ACT UP, started Gay Men's Health Crisis, you know, Academy Award nominated, Tony winning playwright. I mean, the guy is really terrific. 
he wrote a front page article in the San Francisco Examiner and the title was an open letter to Dr. Anthony Fauci, an incompetent idiot. <laughs> and he called me a murderer. The thing was like, oh my God, uh, he, here we go. I didn't train for this. But what I did right, I think, is that many of my scientific colleagues were totally put aback by a constituency group wanting to have a say in the design of a clinical trial, in the design of a, of a concept. And the FDA certainly didn't want any part of their saying what the rapidity or not of the approval of a drug would be. Mm -hmm. So they were not being listened to. So they did iconoclastic things. You know, they would dress weirdly goth dresses, you know, with things that scare the conservative scientific community. And they also did some outrageous things, you know, chain themselves to Wall Street, go into St. Patrick Cathedral, grab the chalice and throw it on the floor. So when you saw activists, everybody ran away. And, and very few people listened to what they said. So right after about a year of so of attacking me, I was saying, why are they attacking me? And then I realized, I said, you know, this is nothing personal with them. They just need attention. So I started to read what they wrote and listen to what they said. And it became clear that they were right. They were absolutely on the money. We were too rigid. We were, we were treating HIV like hypertension when you when you're testing a new drug. We didn't realize that, as they said so well, Larry Kramer said it in an article that he wrote in the New York Native, that you're talking about drug approval process that by five times outlives our lifespan. So what are you talking about? Why can't we get on a clinical trial? Why is this clinical trial restricted to 150 people when 2,000 people have no other alternative? And I started to really resonate with that. And what I did is that one day in the late 80s, when they were doing one of their demonstrations and the police were getting ready to, to arrest them, I just invited them up to my office. I said, please don't arrest, just bring them up to my office. And we sat down and I started listening to what they said. We didn't agree on everything, but the fact that I was listening to them completely changed everything. And then after that, it was, let's see if we can work things out. And that was the good news. The difficult thing was many of my scientific colleagues, including people that worked for me, really were against that. They didn't want them to have any part at all in the deliberations of how a clinical trial was designed or how a project was designed. And there was a lot of friction that I had to actually get rid of some people on my staff because they refused to, to really interact in a meaningful way with the activists. The, the, the big um, turning point in all of this was um, at a town hall meeting that I went to in San Francisco when the government was completely against what's called a parallel track process, which was having a clinical trial that was a rigid clinical trial, but also allowing other people to have access to the drug outside of the clinical trial. The, the FDA didn't want it, the government didn't want it. And I had been working with some of my colleagues in New York, ACT UP in San Francisco, Project Inform, until finally one day I just was convinced, they're right, that's it. So I went to San Francisco and I was out on the stage giving a, 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 a town hall meeting and I just got up and said, you know, they asked me, it was like a planted question, to Dr. Fauci, tell us, what do you think about parallel track? And I just said, well, now's the time to just go for it. And I said, I totally endorse it. I think despite the opposition, it's a good idea and we should work it out. And sure enough, there was a New York Times reporter in the audience as in addition to Randy Schiltz, you know, the one who wrote the, and the band played on. He was a reporter for the San Francisco Examiner and the LA Times and all over the front page of the papers the next day was top government official breaks with government policy and endorses parallel track. I said, oh, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I, I'm going to really get in trouble. But as a matter of fact, it was a combination of my friendship with George H.W. Bush, who was president at the time, because the White House called up when I got back to Bethesda from San Francisco and said, Tony, what's, what's this all about? And on the phone, I explained to them, this is the right thing to do. And they said, okay, let's do it. And then the FDA came in and that was it. And then after that, there was complete um, synergy between the activists and, and us. Do you sleep? <laughs> uh, very little, very little. I, I, I pack things in. I, I have, I've, I've made a choice. People ask me about that all the time. And I don't complain about it and I don't apologize for it because it's my choice and I made it with my eyes open. Um, I have 
a lot of responsibilities. I do more things than any one person should do. Uh, I mean, I, I still do clinical medicine. I run a, a pretty, pretty good sized lab. I'm the director of a very large institute, and I like to get involved and do get involved in trying to help the field through policy, you know, by the kinds of things I do with the Congress, with the administration. Plus, it any number of editorial boards, yeah. committees, yeah. writing pieces, right. giving interviews, yeah. and interfacing with the media. Right. And being editor of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. And being happily married, <laughs> too. Being I happily mean, married. how do you balance it all? Balance it by deciding that, do you really want to do this? Um, and the answer is, I do. Uh, I work very hard. I work, you know, till late in the evening and night, go home, eat, and work some more. I work every weekend, all day Saturday and part of Sunday. Um, I've um, made some fundamental principles when my children grew up is that I would have dinner with them every night even though it was very late. We, my wife and I used to have some discussions about how healthy is it for a 12 year old to eat dinner at 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> but we, we came to the, to the group decision that it was healthier for a 12, 9 and 6 year old to have dinner with their father and mother every night at 9 o'clock than it is to have the meet at 6.30 when their father wasn't there and their mother was doing something else. So we did that until they grew up. And my wife is also a professional. She's the chair of the Department of Clinical Bioethics at the NIH, so she works very hard. And uh, we've come to an understanding that this is what we both like to do. And, it's, and we are very happy. Um, we don't have a lot of time. We don't waste a lot of time. And what time we have, we, we spend together. Now, I've asked this question of every single subject that I've had the pleasure of interviewing, but this is the first time I can't think of what an alternative would be. But have you ever thought about not being a scientist and a medical doctor? Or what a different career could be? You know, the answer is not seriously. Um, I think I could have thought about being a physician and only a physician and not a scientist. Uh, because it took a while to realize that you like it and you're good at it. But there's something about the patient-physician interaction that's almost in my DNA. Um, so I could see myself being a practicing physician and not a scientist. I can't see myself ever having been a scientist that wasn't a physician. All right, then I'm gonna ask the question a different way and force your hand. If you had to do it all over again and you couldn't choose medicine or science, right. what else do you think you would have done? Uh, it would almost certainly be in the arena of teaching. Teaching something. It could be teaching Latin or it could be teaching English or it could be teaching something. But I, I, I love to teach because I like to take complicated concepts and make them simple for someone to understand. There's a certain rush you get when someone is confused about something and you explain it in a way that they really can understand the concept that you're trying to make. So I would think teaching in whatever subject I happen to, to like if I wasn't doing science or medicine. Thank you so much you're for welcome. joining me, Tony. That was My a pleasure. true pleasure. It was great. It was fun. <laughs>